This week, the Pope released a document emphasizing human dignity and condemning abortion, euthanasia, so-called gender reassignment surgeries, and surrogacy as violating the image of God that all humans bear. But at the same time, we saw former President Trump take a step back from his support for life, indicating that he is against a national law regulating abortion. Let's break it down. Okay, so welcome back to The Family Beacon. After a few weeks away, we are so glad to be back with you. Grace and I have not been um, uh, sitting on our laurels. We've been preparing <laughs> uh, for our annual dinner, uh, mm -hmm. and that is the reason, the, the main reason why we have not had a podcast episode um, uh, the last few weeks. Last week, Wednesday, we were filming all day for That's our right. upcoming annual dinner, which we're really excited about. And Grace will be talking more about that at the end, but I do want to say, Thank you so much for everyone who's registered. The event has sold out. And That's please, right. so uh, if excited. you we are so excited. And if you still want to come and weren't able to get tickets, we do have a wait list. Um, there may mm -hmm. be some more tickets that come available if we have cancellations, things like that. So there is a wait list. Go to mfc.org slash dinner 2024 and you can enter that wait list. Now, uh, as Grace said, I wanted to talk uh, about President Trump, former President Trump, and his latest remarks on abortion. Now, to, st to set the stage for this, you will hear people say, and this is, as far as I know, true, that President Trump is, uh, that his first term, and you know, we, we, well, he may get a second term come November, uh, that that was the most pro-life presidency ever. People will say that. And it, they'll point to things like the fact that he was the first sitting president to speak at the March for Life, and that he appointed three justices to the Supreme Court uh, who were instrumental in overturning Roe v. Wade in 2020, uh, 2021, 2022. <laughs> I'm sorry. 2022. Um, 2022. Thank you, Grace. Mm -hmm. um, so then fast forward to this year, Donald Trump is ramping up his campaign for president. And the New York Times reported in March, just less than a month ago, that uh, President Trump had given his support to a national 15-week ban that is uh, favored by congressional Republicans. In an appearance on a radio show, Trump said, the number of weeks now people are agreeing on 15. And I'm thinking in terms of that, and it'll come out to something that's very reasonable, he said. Very reasonable, very but, reasonable. Very reasonable. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't resist that. I wish I could do the Trump voice. I've tried. Um, I know mine wasn't uh, actually that good, but that's how I yeah, heard it when yeah. you said it. Uh, but people are really, even hardliners are agreeing, <laughs> seems to be 15 weeks, nobody more weeks than that, um, seems to be a number of people <laughs> agreeing at. Okay, it's hard to read his quotes because although when he's talking, and I'm, I'm totally serious right now, when he's talking, you can understand him, but when you're reading his quote, it sounds completely incoherent. I'm sorry. Uh, 15 <laughs> weeks seems to be a number that people are agreeing at, but I'll make that announcement at the appropriate time. So he didn't, he, he didn't make that formal <laughs> announcement. Um, now, as I said, this is something that, Grace, you and I know Republicans uh, at the federal level support. We've, I think, talked about this on the podcast before. Uh, people such as Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, we'll talk about him later, um, have said this would be a measure that would bring the country together um, and it would be a good, uh, you know, a good compromise, basically. Um, but anyway, we probably won't see that federal legislation uh, if President Trump wins in November, or will we? I'll get back to that in a little bit, because this week on April 8th, Trump announced that he would not support a federal ban on abortion and that the issue would be left to the states. I think it's very mm. unfortunate he he even used the words abortion rights and that has been no. attacked. No, no, no. By, messaging yeah, suicide. Yeah, people messaging suicide, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been quick to point out that there is no such thing as a right to abortion. Mm -hmm. And Grace, this is how the New York Times described this. On abortion, Trump chooses politics over principles. Mm. It's hard, it's hard to argue. I find myself for once 
on the side of the New York Times, at least as that headline is written. And, yeah. you know, whenever you have a politician changing course like this, it's going to create a news cycle. And this is no different. Um, but I will say, though, actually, you know what? I'm going to get to that in a minute. What I want to talk first of all um, about Grace is what the the response we've seen from some of um, yeah, yeah some of the critics of this uh, change in uh, policy. So, uh, Marjorie Dannenfelser is one of our nation's leading pro life voices. As the president of uh, SBA list, Susan B. Anthony, pro life America, she said, "We are deeply disappointed in President Trump's position." Former Vice President Mike Pence, um, who has declined so far to endorse former President Trump said President Trump's retreat on the right to life is a slap in the face to the millions of pro-life Americans. And on social media, some conservatives latched on to Trump's reference to abortion rights, arguing that such rights do not exist. And even Senator Lindsey Graham, a vocal Trump ally, said on X or Twitter that he respectfully disagrees with Trump's new position. Mm -hmm. As he often does, Trump went after his critics by name, I should say. I'm reading from uh, the AP News uh, reporting on April 8th. Uh, so this is a, a Trump quote or a Trump tweet. Lindsay, Marjorie, and others <laughs> fought for years unsuccessfully until I came along and got the job done. They were gone, never to be heard from again until now. Trump <laughs> said on social media. He added, the Democrats are thrilled with Lindsay. No one's more thrilled with Lindsay because they want this issue to simmer on for a long, as long a period as possible. No, I, I'm sorry. I do know. I want to apologize to our viewers. I know that's a bad Trump impersonation. It sounds like a New York City garbage man. So funny, um, though. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. We're here um, to entertain you guys, so you're welcome. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you not entertained? <laughs> so now what Trump did not say, and, and people could argue this is a smart move, what Trump did not say was that he would veto an abortion ban if it was sent to him by the legislature. Mm -hmm. That's crucial because, Absolutely. of course, in our system, bills start in the legislature. How does a bill become a law? We've all seen, um, I was about to say School of Rock. What am I thinking of? Um, what did you say? House. Schoolhouse Rock. Thank you to our Oh, producer, my Christine. goodness. Everyone has seen Schoolhouse Rock. We know how a bill becomes a law not school of rock. Sorry about that. Again, are you not entertained? So we could see if, if, if conservatives are able to take back the Senate this fall, yeah. which uh, they have a very good chance of doing the U.S. Senate, and if they maintain their control of the U.S. House, and if Trump wins the election, which all of these things are very possible right now, we could see legislation landing on Trump's desk. Now, granted, it didn't happen the first time he was in office and when Republicans had control of both houses. Uh, but it, we could see legislation landing on his desk. That would be a big uh, that would be a big step forward for life, a, a 15 week ban or something similar. And he may not veto it. He's saying he he's not saying he will. So he's yeah. trying to position himself as a moderate on abortion, which, frankly, we are we already knew he was. Mm -hmm. And it's disappointing, but at the same time, it's not fatal to to him as a candidate. So uh, the the AP News article, Grace, uh, concludes uh, this portion, this this section, by saying, despite the infighting, Trump's team is making the calculation that his evangelical base, among the most loyal elements in his coalition, will have his back when it matters most. And recent history suggests he's probably right. Okay, and that's actually completely accurate. But I do want to say something about evangelicals. Um, there's been this narrative that evangelicals have this godlike uh, respect for Trump, that they think he's this latter-day prophet. Well, not but, I, not um, you. <laughs> no, right. Uh, you and I do not feel that way. Mm -hmm. Trump has done some really good things. Um and, and he's advanced the pro-life cause. We've talked about that in this mm -hmm. episode. We've talked about that many times before. Um, but actually, but you know, no evangelicals, he's no saint. But I also want to push back on the idea, Grace, that evangelicals think that Trump is some sort of godsend, that he, mm -hmm. that they, I, I think evangelicals are actually rational people in our political system. Yeah. And they're choosing to support the candidate who reflects their values the most. Okay. Mm -hmm. So- and they haven't really been given a choice in the sense that 
uh, uh, the sense that, you know, as our country changes demographically and religiously, the Democratic Party has moved away from uh, having moderate pro-life Democrats within the caucus, from having um, uh, Democrats who would defend the family, who would vote against things like transgender uh, ideology and gay marriage. Those people have been kicked out of the National Democratic Party, sad to say. So the fact that conservative evangelicals are, uh, are attaching themselves to Trump, even despite statements like this, right, is not irrational. They are, um, and I will, I will. So, Ali Beth Stuckey, who's a, a, po a podcaster uh, that we've referenced here, and, and she uh, is the Relatable podcast, right, Grace? That's right, yeah. Yeah, and and I know I know that um, she's someone that you really respect, and I everything I've seen from her has been great. Because mm -hmm. she made a point um, that you know Biden is actively expanding abortion in every way that he can as president. Um, RFK Jr. has recently picked a pro-abortion woman as his running mate. So for pro-life voters this fall, uh, it's really it really will be a choice. Uh, yeah. It's not like Trump is going to be the just the most pro-life candidate on your ballot in all likelihood, the most pro-life major candidate. He will likely be the only major pro-life candidate on the ballot. So it's and a we choice. Pro-life in like scare quotes because of course he's not all the way where we want him to be, but he's right. more pro-life than the other candidates. He is, of course, he yeah. he wants some restrictions on abortion. He's not for all out free access to abortion on demand for any reason whatsoever. That's exactly right. So uh, one thing that conserv uh, that the president always does, this just goes back 40 years, Republican presidents have always supported the Mexico City policy, which, pre which prevents the federal government from funding abortions in foreign countries. Democratic uh, administrations have always uh, 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 funded abortions in foreign countries, which I just don't think is something we want our country doing. So there, that's just one example of things that are that are executive orders within the within the executive branch that Trump could do to be a pro-life president. And we know he will do it because he did it if, if he's elected again, because he did it in 2017 when he came in, when he first came in. So in conclusion, in November, uh, for pro-life people, uh, the choice is between one flawed pro-life candidate or, and nobody. You know, there's nobody else who is likely to win who is pro-life, you know, barring some sort of lightning strike event. OK, so that's sad. And, and, and we're telling you, you folks listening and watching, uh, because we're not we're not we're not on Trump's team. If Trump wants to be on our team, he can he can choose to defend life. And we want him to do that. And we want to encourage him to do that. But but it's not like it's not like Biden is on our team. RFK Jr. is not on our team on this issue. And we have to call it what it is. So, uh, Grace, what do you think about about Trump's statements on on life? Yeah, I think we can, you know, recognize the good that he has done for the pro-life movement, like appointing those Supreme Court justices, like speaking at the March for Life, while also recognizing that it doesn't go nearly far enough. And so if he were to be elected, we, the pro-life pro -life generation, would have to really hold him accountable and say, this is what we want. Um, these are measures that are very realistic and very uh, necessary in our country. And so we just have to get loud if he was elected and really push him to do what is right, not just what is convenient. And one thing that I do want to bring up is on Monday, part of his statement that Trump made was he said, quote, my view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint. That's what he said. And I just want to point that out as utterly incorrect, because what he's saying there is that basically everyone's at peace with where abortion access is right now. That is not true. No one is at peace. No one is happy with where where things are at, because on one hand, we've got the abortion lobby that's fuming and they want unrestricted abortion access, truly. And they're going to keep campaigning until they until they receive federal abortion legislation that goes even beyond what Roe allowed or until the pro-life side wins. And even if we even if we did win, they'd still keep pushing for that. Let's be real. And then on the other side of the coin, we've got pro-life advocates like ourselves that are not going to rest until every life is protected under law. And we know the law is a moral teacher. So we just see Trump punting here. And that's not appreciated whatsoever. I'm not surprised by that. Uh, but again, we can recognize the good that he has done while seeing that his statements and his beliefs on life and abortion don't go far enough. 
Um, so we'll no, have to I, see. I want to say, I, I, so, I'm sorry to cut you off. You're there, go, Grace. go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I agree that we will, will have to see what, what happens. But that statement that you brought up is just mm-hmm. so depressing. I know. Because I know. What, it signals, what it signals in a state like Minnesota or Michigan uh, mm-hmm. or uh, uh, Wisconsin or other states where um, a uh, pro-abortion legislators have been successful in, in, in Minnesota, as we've discussed many times, now after Dobbs, uh, abortion so-called rights, not rights, have been expanded as far as, as, far as they can go. Um, we, have, we have the same abortion laws as North Korea, abortion up until the moment of birth for any reason, mm-hmm. and, and no protection for infants born alive during the mm-hmm. course of an abortion. Like it Renee is Carlson. impossible. Yeah. Go like ahead. Renee Carlson of True North Legal has said, in our state, in Minnesota, uh, preborn girls, women, and yeah, women, women, girls, and preborn children have less rights than cattle and reptiles. That's unacceptable. And so you're right, Moses, this statement is very depressing. So he's yeah, he's just leaving us out to dry as as pro life mm-hmm. Minnesotans living in a purple state, and and mm-hmm. there are millions of people who are in that situation, and 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 Trump saying nope, federal government ain't going to do a thing about it. So I want to talk about that more because I might get more angry as mm-hmm. as we said, the picture is complicated. It's not it's not like um, this may just be a shrewd move, although not a morally defensible move for former President Trump. He thinks now, it's shrewd. He thinks it's shrewd. Yeah, we'll mm-hmm. see. Uh, now, turning to uh, the Pope, and I do think yes. it's funny because we are often uh, praising President Trump on this podcast. He's done uh, a lot of good for life and family, and we have often been critical of Pope Francis. And uh, because, for example, just as recently as I think December, uh, he announced that um, uh, gay weddings could be blessed within uh, within Roman Catholic churches, if uh, if it was clear that it was not a marriage, but rather some type of just a blessing of their union, which is weasel words, right? And and so that's disappointing, and and we call that out at the time. Uh, and so now there's a new declaration from the Vatican, and it's really good. But I do want to ask, you know, why do we as Protestants take that seriously? And, you know, we are Protestants. Um, most of our listeners and viewers are too, although we're very glad to have anybody along for the ride who is Roman Catholic. We respect them. Uh, we respect our, our allies in, uh, in that church. And we really, we do appreciate the leadership that the Roman Catholic Church has shown at, on social issues. From the very beginning, uh, the, the Roman Catholics and Protestants have been collaborating in the pro-life movement. You know, that's been going on for decades and decades. And there's collaboration, there's mutual respect. And that's also true on issues of gender and other life and family issues. So when we see something from the Vatican that's really questionable, as Protestants, you know, we can feel free to ignore that, which is a, a really nice feeling. But this statement is not something we should ignore. It's something that I think, and Grace, you'll you'll tell us so much more about this. This is something I would love to see every Protestant church sign on to. Oh, you know, absolutely. Because, mm-hmm. So, so l- without further ado, tell us more about this statement, Grace. Yeah, Moses, let's talk about it. So on Monday of this week, the Vatican released a document which is entitled Dignitas Infinita. And this is basically a long declaration emphasizing human dignity. Now, not only does it do that, but it goes deeper. The document identifies about a dozen modern day examples of what the Vatican classifies as violations of our dignity as human beings. And that list, you guys, includes abortion, so-called gender reassignment surgeries, and euthanasia and surrogacy. So that's a lot of our issues right there. That's a lot of the issues we've seen come up this legislative session and last legislative session. And the reason I want to break it down for you guys is, one, what Moses mentioned about how Protestants and Catholics work together on these issues, but also because the Vatican brings up some very good points um, in in this document that I think are good for us as Protestants to have in our back pocket. So for the sake of time, I'm going to skip breaking down abortion because I think everyone who listens to this podcast is very well equipped at how to respond to 
arguments for abortion. But what perhaps we aren't super equipped with is arguments against euthanasia, against uh, so-called gender reassignment surgery, and of course, surrogacy. So let's start with euthanasia. Let's talk about what the Vatican said and some key points that we can really pull out of that statement and again, stick in our back pocket. So the Vatican said, quote, there is a special case of human dignity violation that is quieter but swiftly gaining ground. It is unique in how it utilizes a mistaken understanding of human dignity to turn the concept of dignity against life itself. It continues, the Vatican continues to say, it must be strongly reiterated that suffering does not cause the sick to lose their dignity. Instead, suffering can become an opportunity. I know, so good. Mic drop. And it gets better, Moses. Instead, suffering can become an opportunity to strengthen the bonds of mutual belonging and gain greater awareness of the precious value of each person to the whole human family. I love that quote there. The things I really love about it is one, the point that we have made multiple times on this podcast and also our policy team has made it our capital and the pushes for assisted suicide. That is suffering of an individual does not cause that suffering person to lose their dignity. Absolutely not. It doesn't make them less worthy of life or less valuable. Uh, and then I also love how it emphasizes, how that quote emphasizes the the precious value of each person to the whole human family that suffering can bring and how it strengthens the bond of family and belonging. Uh, c- that quote continues to say, we must accompany people towards death, but not provoke death or facilitate any form of suicide. Life is a right, not death, which must be welcomed, not administered. So beautifully said, so well said, truly, because we've talked about this on the podcast before. Um, A lot of the times, a lot of the people at the Capitol that are arguing for assisted suicide, they are viewing death as this right. They're, they're viewing, Mm -hmm. um, they're viewing, they, they want to have as much control over the circumstances of their death as possible because they realize that they can't control if they're going to die. Therefore, they want to control when they're going to die, how they're going to die. Uh, but that is playing God, as we've talked about before. And I think that quote that I just read is a great um, a great thing to have in your pocket to pull out and remember that we should always be hand in hand with those, the sick, the dying, and we should um, stay by their side, but we should never provoke death or facilitate suicide because that's not moral and that's playing God. So, Moses, do you have any thoughts on this before I move on to what the Vatican said about gender? I think I think you've put it in a nutshell. So, so not really. Okay, Thank you. absolutely. So, on gender, I think this was really really well done again. The church said that it first of all wishes to reaffirm every person regardless of sexual orientation um, that they ought to be respected in dignity and treated with consideration. And then the Vatican also goes on to uh reject any kind of unjust discrimination towards people struggling with their sexual orientation. And they specifically, they specifically um, reject any form of quote, aggression or violence towards people. And I think that's a really great place to start to say, we reject this. We think that everyone, regardless of their sexual orientation should be respected and they have dignity as a human being. That is so well done. Uh, But the church doesn't just stop there. The Vatican doesn't stop there. The Vatican continues to say that they recall human life in all dimensions uh, is a gift from God, which is, that's also a great place to go, that life is a gift. And then they say, this gift is to be accepted with gratitude and placed at the service of the good. Now, let me break that down for you a little bit. What they're saying here, this is theological. They're saying that God is the highest good. God is, you cannot be more good than God. Uh, every goodness flows from him and you can never be better than God. You can never be more good than him. And so therefore, everything that he has given us is a gift. And so all of the gifts that we've been given by God must be used to serve his goodness. And that's a beautiful way of saying it. Uh, the quote continues to say, Desiring a personal self-determination as gender theory prescribes, apart from this fundamental truth that human life is a gift, amounts to a concession to the age-old temptation to make oneself God, entering into competition with the true God of love revealed to us in the gospel. Again, truth bombs. So well said. Because what they say here is making clear that God is love. Again, just like God is the epitome of goodness, he is also the very essence of love itself. We can never out-love God. And therefore, um, these temptations that we're seeing floating around uh, in our world today about our bodies, our bodies and our life and what we've been given, 
uh, these are age old temptations. There is nothing new under the sun. This is not something new that we're seeing. We've always seen the creature trying to play God and trying to make oneself God, like this quote says. And so I think those are great points to keep, uh, keep in your pocket. Moses, do you have thoughts here? I just think this is beautifully mm-hmm. stated. I mean, and and I think, you know, there there's some there's some philosophical language and yeah. theological language here as you pointed out. I also think though that this is something that if we get right down to it, most people should and do intuitively understand. We cannot really make ourselves other than we are. Mm-hmm. We cannot we cannot I I can't make myself into a fox or a woman. Or anything that I am not, you know, like I, I can, I can, um, I can cover my body with tattoos. I can, mm-hmm. um, you know, I can, I can change. I, I can get like those weird sharp teeth implants. Please don't, Moses. That would not be your look. I, that would not mm-hmm. be a, a great. Your look Your wife would not appreciate um, it. Uh, <laughs> I've talked to her about it, and she said no, no. <laughs> what a bummer for you. So. Exactly. But doing those changes, they would only change my exterior. They would not change who I am. And it is the same thing with uh, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, gender surgery. Now, yeah, if you're taking hormones and anything that's going on inside your body, yeah, like if you, if you, let's say that you're a, uh, a, a, a girl and you're taking testosterone, and this is a tragic place to be in, that is not a healthy thing to do by any means, uh, you're, there's going to be long-term health effects, and maybe you're going to see some more aggression, you know, like that's, a, that's a, uh, something that people associate with women taking testosterone. Okay, well, that doesn't change who you fundamentally are. And you are trying to play God. So I'm just reiterating this. And I think people fundamentally do understand this. It is simply not possible for us to change who we fundamentally are. The Vatican is trying to say this in language that hopefully, I really hope, can create a consensus. You know, obviously, we can't... um, (laughs) <laughs> wouldn't it be great if every single person who was convinced of this lie read this document and was like, no, I'm wrong about that. That's not what I'm saying. We're, we're not. This isn't going to be the end of the debate. But I would love to see people who are on the fence about this, who are, don't fully understand how to articulate this, just to read this document. This is such a great place to start. Mm-hmm. And I love seeing this. It came out of nowhere for me. Mm-hmm. So anyway, keep going. Yeah, Moses, actually what you were saying about uh, – you know, you can try to do all these surgeries that would make you a woman, but you'd never be a woman. It just made me think of the book Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And that book, first of all, people misunderstand that they think Frankenstein's the monster. No, no, no. Frankenstein is the crazy scientist guy that is trying to make this monster. Right. And in fact, he's trying to make a human. Well, it makes me think of this book because this scientist, again, is trying to make a human. He's trying to be God himself. He is trying to be the first human to create another human, and he fails. He is not able to make a human. He tries to play God, and he fails epically. Instead, there's this disjointed mass of bones and sinew that uh, is it's truly a, a walking monster, and is his body is so, so mutilated. This monster's body is mutilated beyond repair, and he ultimately uh, ends up killing himself. Because he is so, so discomforted with um, this. Spoiler alert, Grace. Sorry, sorry. I know. Okay, I probably shouldn't have said that, guys. For a 150-year-old book. But you should read it. It's so good. <laughs> Anyways, all this to say is that it really makes me think of that. You know, no matter how hard we try to play God, we will always fall short and it always ends in disaster. So highly recommend that. But continuing with the Vatican, uh, they specifically condemn sex change. And I'll read you the portion wherein it is condemned. They say, creation is prior to us and must be received as a gift. At the same time, we are called to protect our humanity. And this means in the first place, accepting it and respecting it as it was created. Again, so good. That's what we're called to do as finite uh, finite beings. We're called to respect and accept how God created us. And of course, that's hard for the secular world to accept. So let's not spend more time on gender, even though Moses and I are both so passionate about it. As we are passionate about our other issues, we could spend a whole episode just talking about this. But let's move on to what the Vatican said about surrogacy, because they also had some excellent points there. They said that, quote, the path to peace calls for respect for life, for every human life, starting with the life of the unborn child in the mother's womb which cannot be suppressed or turned into an object of tracketing. 
trafficking, excuse me. Now that's a really, really good statement there. And our director of policy, Becca, actually testified at the Capitol and used a very similar line when she was testifying against surrogacy. She said that we should not turn children into objects of trafficking. And she she had she had great points. So make sure you go check out her testimony. I'll have Do you it. think that the Pope is watching um Becca's testimony and saying You never oh, know. I will that say seems really good. I will say Becca got those points from Katie Faust, who is one of the leaders in the okay. children's rights movement. So potentially he's listening to Katie Faust. She founded them before us. And so, you know, Becca would give full credit to to that statement of Katie. But yeah. Sure. Definitely, definitely could be could be there. He could be paying attention to Katie Faust. Uh, but the Vatican goes on to say, quote, I deem deplorable the practice of the so-called surrogate motherhood, which represents a grave violation of the dignity of woman and child based on the exploitation of situations of mother's material needs. A child is always a gift and never the basis of a commercial contract, end quote. So good. I think that that's pretty clear. That's not overly philosophical or theological like the other the other quotes. So I don't think I need to break it down too much. But again, the t- key takeaways here that you guys should take note of, write down on your phone so you can pull it out and reference, is that one, sur- surrogacy is an impersonal process that turns a child just into an object, into a transaction. It makes it so that children can be bought and sold, which of course is like trafficking. And also surrogacy morphs the natural and very good desire for children into an unjust entitlement. As we've talked about on the podcast before, our heart does go out to couples that are struggling with infertility and so desperately want children. However, like we talked about just a few moments ago, all that we receive from God is a gift and God can choose to withhold certain gifts to us and give certain gifts to others. And we are not entitled to all the gifts in the world. We are not entitled. Um, And so surrogacy brings an unjust entitlement uh, into the picture. Not only that, but surrogacy also violates a woman's dignity. It leaves her detached from the child growing in her womb, and it ultimately makes her a means to the end for the desires for others. So therefore, the Vatican called for this practice to be universally banned. Again, check out Becca's testimony linked below. Very, very good. Brings up very similar points. Uh, We spent a lot of time breaking that down. I am just so grateful for that document. I think, again, just... It was written very, very well, approached it in a very logical way. I think we need to see more of this. I said to Moses, I think Monday, that I just would love to see Protestants come out with a document like this or sign on to something like this because I think what the Catholic Church has done very well is be unified on things like this. They're very good at being unified. I mean, they have the Pope Polo. It's not like we have a Protestant Pope that dictates all things for all the evangelicals, all the Protestants. So I think they're good at being unified on cultural issues. And I think that Protestants need to do a bit better in that area. I think a lot of us individually have the right mindset, but I think we need to come together under one umbrella and collectively say, this is wrong. This is the way forward. So a lot of info there. Please share this episode if you found it very helpful. I trust that you did. Without further ado, though, Moses, um, let's make the announcement about our dinner. We're very excited. Do you want to go ahead and announce it? I will announce this. I would like to uh, congratulate everyone who will be coming to our 2024 annual dinner on April 26th because the MC will be none other than, drumroll please... Grace Lawrence. <laughs> so I am I personally am very excited, uh, Grace, because, you know, you have so much energy, which is what makes you such a great podcast host, as well as um, the many other great qualities that you bring to this. Um, and I think those are going to be so appreciated by our guests on April 26th. So I'm really excited for that. Thank you, Moses. I'm truly so excited. And, you know, the dinner is a huge group effort. Moses is going to be working really hard on AV. So that's audio visual. He's going to be the one making the lighting look good, making the sound good, making it seem super epic. And then I'll be upstage. So it'll be Moses and I working together to make that event as awesome as possible, along with the rest of our team. The rest of our team is doing a ton of work as well. So we're very excited to see you there. And Moses, I did want to talk about what we were reading, but this episode is getting quite long. So what do you say that we punt it to next week? We could punt that to next week. Sounds good. Do you have a verse for us for closing? I do. I do have a verse, and um, it's a little bit longer, so it's maybe good that we're skipping the Mm. um, 
skipping the uh, the the book. I'll just read. I'll just read the first five verses. Actually, what I'd like to encourage everyone to do is just go read all of Psalm twenty seven. It's one of the best, in my view, one of the best psalms in the entire Bible. And uh, I'll just start with the first five verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So that whole psalm is full of language like that, and it ends with mm-hmm. one of my favorite verses in the whole time, in the whole Bible. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Mm-hmm. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So that is my that is my exhortation uh, uh, for this for for all of us uh, that we would uh, that we would cling to uh, the grace of God that we would um, that that we that he that we would that our dearest wish would be to dwell in His house forever and that with that promise with that shining city in mind that we would wait for Him that we would be of good courage that we would be strengthened and that we would not be afraid. Grace, I want to thank you and I want to thank everyone for watching and listening to this episode of the Family Beacon Podcast. We will be back with you next week. Until then, thanks so much for watching or listening. 